How to resolve trust issues in a relationship? Without trust, you have nothing. With it, you can do great things. Today's breakthrough ideas are around spouses dealing with trust issues, suspected cheating spouse, or a confirmed cheating spouse. How to process this strategy and how to move on? We will also look into who gets to define sexual morality for us. What does it have to do with spirituality and various levels of bad destructive behavior can be intercepted? So when we think about trust issues in relationships, it can fall into various categories. Um, number one is that there is a doubt, a fear from one of the spouses. In that situation, what I would typically recommend is to take a look at the root cause. What is it? Right? Is this something related to the insecurity of one of the spouses? Um, has there been certain signs, or it's just a fear because people have heard from? their own friends or people around them of such cases? Um, has Have they been listening to someone from their friend circle who has been putting in those doubts and those fears? Um, is it because of a past experience? What is it, right? What is the root cause? Um, after that, I would probably recommend an uh, honest conversation, right? And we talked about this in episode five when we were talking about timings and we were talking about check-ins, right? So we were discussing about various forms of check-ins that you can check in with the other spouse. First, to identify what is it that they like and what is it that they're missing, right? And we talked about, you know, languages of appreciation in our last episode as well. So things like, you know, respect, uh, feeling loved, feeling uh, important enough, feeling significant, uh, growth in relationship, happiness, and caring for each other, emotional needs and physical needs as well, right? So to, to have a check-in around that and then see what is important for each spouse and how they are feeling, right? So sometimes they can describe it on a scale of 1 to 10, for example, and if it's a relatively lower number and it's important for them, uh, then it's important to figure out what it is that is missing, Right. So sometimes one of the spouses may have higher expectations uh, regarding their emotional needs or some one of the spouse may have a higher expectation regarding their physical need. Right. And the other one may not be doing that. And that could be due to various reasons. Um, that could be because their physical needs are not being met or their emotional needs are not being met. Um, they are too busy. They are stressed out. So just having that conversation to first understand what is the need and to then understand what is it stopping the other person would really go a long way. So once you understand that, uh, it's very important to not think that why the other person have this need, right? People are different and as part of, you know, companionship, as part of being a spouse, you know, there are certain things that are expected in, to, to be given in that relationship, right? So once you know those things and once you understand where your spouse is coming from, then you can think about how you can remove the obstacles in your own life, right? So it could be reducing some workload, reducing stress. So sometimes you may be stressing out about other things such as work and business and career and so on and so forth. And then we are saying, oh, I'm doing it for my family so that we can have a great vacation or we can do this or we can buy this, right? And I can have more time in the future. But what is that for? Right. If your current career, your current job, your current activities, your current volunteer projects, like your community work is stopping you from having a healthy relationship at home, then what is it for? Right. Maybe your priorities are wrong. Maybe you need to uh, either outsource some of your activities, some of your projects, some of your tasks, or maybe you need to cut down on some of your commitments. Right. So once you understand that, uh, it's very important. Right. I mean, I, I think I will repeat that to understand and appreciate the needs of other person, even though that may be like not your needs. We talked about it in the last episode, right? What you need may be completely opposite than what your partner needs, right? So it's very important to think about that. Now, then the second thing is to think about, okay, what can I do about it, right? How can I improve it? Um, at the same time, uh, it could be that there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing uh, that is a shortcoming from you. It's just that, uh, due to faith issues, due to greed, uh, due to the nature of your spouse, he or she has a problem himself or herself, right? And that's a different situation, right? Now we're trying to understand what can be done from your side, from the side of a person who's suspecting um, the spouse to be cheating or um, have seen the spouse to cheat or is confirmed that the spouse has cheated. May Allah protect us all. Uh, the similar things can be applied from a spouse who's wife or husband is suspecting them of cheating, right? 
Okay, so now then, then we move on, right? So basically, let's say you've talked about it, there's nothing wrong, you know, everything is fine, and it's just a fear that you have, right? Uh, what can you do in that point, right? So firstly, you have to realize that, look, you know, we are influenced by other people, we are influenced by our friends, we are influenced by what we read. So you may want to check what kind of content you are consuming, right? Next thing is to think about uh, what is your expectations from Allah and your belief in Qadr, right? To always remind yourself that, look, there is nothing for me to doubt what I'm doubting, right? There's no signs for that. And I'm just afraid that it might happen. That could be because of a past experience and so on and so forth, right? So remember that firstly, no harm, no emotional harm, no physical harm, no discomfort can come to you, can approach you, can afflict you, except it has to be approved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And what is your expectation about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is he going to choose good for you or is he going to choose bad for you? If you think Allah is going to choose, choose evil for you, what is, where is that coming from? Why do you have evil expectations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? And we have talked about this in various episodes in what you expect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And then remember, if it has to come to you, it will come, right? So why... Are you imagining this every day and living the same thing every day while it has not even happened to you, right? Isn't that also sort of being ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are not contemplating and reflecting on all the good things that he has given you and you're thinking of something that may happen to you, right? So it's something uh, to, to think about. Right? Why would you not po focus on positive things in your life? Uh, next point here uh, is active investigations, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pro prohibits us from, you know, be, from, from tajassus, you know, from spying, from investigating, from unnecessary, just trying to figure out, just trying to always chase, just trying to always figure out where my husband is, where my wife is, and so on and so forth, right? To the point that, you know, when the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions would come in, they would inform their family that they're coming in, right? And part of that is not to just like show up, you know, and surprise the family, Right. So so something to think about. Right. I mean, are you over investigating? Right. Are you, are you trying to find things that you don't need to find? Are you trying to find things that are hurting you? Right. And then finally, who are your advisors? Right. So when you think about this thing, when you have fear, who do you talk to? Do you talk to people who remind you of good things from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who remind you to put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or are you talking to people who have experienced this from their spouses? Right. When you hear stories from them, maybe that is affecting you. So again, back to what kind of content are you feeding yourself? And this is something that's also applicable in other situations in which, you know, some of the friends would be like, oh, my God, your husband does this to you. Uh, how can you listen to this? How can you provide this much support to your husband? You know, he should do this and so on and so forth and vice versa right same thing applies for brothers as well and you know those people are not really aware of your situation they don't know what your spouse is doing for you they're just like measuring or um, checking in on your situation from their own uh, angle right and that could be totally different right and they may advise you that oh this relationship is never going to work out you know this will this is um this is uh, torture this is oppression uh this is abuse right and they're just speaking from their own way right so do you have trusted advisors who know what they're talking about right? and remember any decision that you make should be your own decision right you should not be just doing something because your friends said that oh you should do this you should take you should not respond to this you should not give this to your husband you should not give this to your wife you know your wife doesn't have a right for this your husband doesn't have a right for this right and they are talking about it from their own culture or their own families whereas marriage and rights and uh, with spouses is very dependent on culture on how you where you both come from how you both grew and what is it that you guys expect from each other right and what is expected of one person what is what is the ability of one person can be totally different from the other and we all have to see what what we are able to do and what we are capable of doing right now same thing is um you know if, if the demand of one of the spouses is higher than what the other person is able to do right then you know you could think about what are some of the other alternative ways of fulfilling those desires right which are permissible in the in the sharia of islam right for the greater good and so on and so forth. Anyway, so let's come to the point that this is not a fear, this is not a doubt, it's not a concern, but it has actually happened, right? And, you know, the person, your spouse, has confirmed interest in other person or has confirmed to actual intimacy with someone else outside of marriage, right? Uh, 
you know, this is something uh, that is a big, big, uh, big trauma. It's a big emotional uh, setback, right? So how do we deal with that? Now, if it has if it has been done in a way that is permissible in the in the deen of Allah, in the way of Allah, right? Then it's a different way to deal with it. And if it's you know not permissible in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa taala, then it's a different way to deal with it, right? And now we'll talk about like who gets to define all these ethics and who gets to define our sexual morality in a bit. We'll talk about it in our spirituality section. But let's think about it right now. First, um, think about it that it has it is a, it's a painful thing that has happened to you. Okay, now as we talked about it earlier, look, if it was in your hand, if you were in charge, if you were running this world, if you were running the show, you would have prevented it, right? Okay, but who is really in, in charge here, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the real in charge here, right? And he allowed that to happen to you, okay? Now, do you expect Allah to do something evil to you, something bad to you, or you expect Allah to do something that has a greater good, right? And now this is where your trust in Allah comes from, right? So imagine you're going somewhere with your friend, okay? And, you know, she takes a turn that is totally opposite to the direction that you thought you guys will be traveling, right? I mean, you've, you've always gone to that place, that restaurant, that place, and like she just took a total turn, right? If you tr trust that person and she says, you know what, don't worry about it, just trust me, right? Would you trust her, right? So it depends on what you think her abilities are. If you think that she is a smart person, she knows what she's doing, and you'll trust in her, right? Versus if you think that, you know, the person is weak, you know, she makes some um, not so great decisions at the moment, and you probably wouldn't trust her, right? But what is it, you know, as, as we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the highest example, what do we expect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? Why do I need to give it a wrong meaning? Yes, it's painful. I'm not denying that. Why do we have to give it a wrong meaning? Right? So we all are encouraged to read, for example, Surah Al-Kahf. Right? And we have these three, three stories in which things happen, like the ship, the incident of a boy being killed, and, you know, and the wall of the orphan. And in the short form, in the short term, with a short vision, it looks like it's a, it's a very painful thing that has happened. But there's a greater good. Right? So what is our expectation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now, second thing is, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his kitab, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la tattabi'u khutuwati shaytan wa man yattabi'u khutuwati shaytan fa innahu ya'muru bil fahshai wal munkar wa lawla fadlullahi alaykum wa rahmatuhu ma zaka minkum min ahadin abada wa lakin Allah yuzak O you who have believed, do not follow the footsteps of shaitan. And whoever follows the footsteps of shaitan, indeed he enjoins immorality and wrongdoing. Right? So Allah is clearly instructing us not to follow the steps of shaitan. And the shaitan, Allah is declaring that he is the one who is going to be enjoining immorality and wrongdoing. Okay, the next step, the next information, the next part of the verse is very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look, if not for the favor of Allah upon you and his mercy, not one of you would have been pure ever. But Allah purifies whom he wills and Allah is hearing and knowing. SubhanAllah. So think about it. Why is that important? Go ahead and pause the audio and let's, let's see if you can reflect the point I'm trying to make here. So, I, ho I hope you got it, but think about this. Look, had Allah willed, the situation could have been reversed, right? You could be the one who would have cheated and your spouse could be the one who have found you to be cheated, right? So think about this, that Allah protected you. And you are the one who are on the receiving end, right? So you are the one who is receiving this painful calamity that your spouse, you know, cheated. Worse is if you were to have done that act, how bad it would, ha would it have been, right? And Allah is saying, look, this is only from the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it is not the way it is, right? Otherwise, you, the situation could have been reversed. The second thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, وَالْيَعْفُوا وَالْيَسْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ 
And look, this can also be, you know, applicable to certain situation in which a parent has to, you know, finds out that, you know, their child did something outside of marriage, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, look, you know, uh, let them pardon and overlook, right? And look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, would you not like that Allah should forgive you? And Allah is forgiving and merciful. So think about it. How many rights of Allah do we violate? How are we with our salah, with our prayers, with our other obligations? How many, how many of them do we violate left, right, and center? Right? And don't we want Allah to forgive us? So Allah is teaching us and telling us to be forgiving as well. Next thing to think about is what meaning will you give it? Right? Is this something that is going to reduce your own self-esteem or your own self-confidence? Right, as we talked about it earlier, I mean, this may have nothing to do with you. It may be just the greed and the desires and following the desires from your own spouse. So it's not something to be ashamed of in a sense that it does not mean that you are incapable. There's something wrong with you. Um, you fall short on your um, on your commitments and you fall short on your own, own role. I mean, there may be something that you may have you know, to do with this. And this is what we talked about earlier, to intercept this early and to have this regular check-ins and so on and so forth. But in many cases, it's also the case that it's just the case, it's just a issue with the other spouse and he or she basically is falling into their own desires and greed. And how to process this emotional trauma? Uh, we talked about it in episode 16. We talked about detailed step-by-step -step ways on how you can understand a multi-layered, you know, complex emotional experience. Okay, now everything has been, you know, out there. Now everybody knows what happened, like, you know, hopefully within the family and so on and so forth, right? So something to think about, okay, what do we do next, right? So first try to understand what is the root cause. Was that like a slip? Right? Was it just like one time thing just happened to, you know, happen and the person is really, really remorseful and has come and has basically committed to true repentance. Right. Are there signs for that? Right. Uh, was it because of some sort of issue within between you and the spouse? Right. Is it something that can be fixed in the future or this is just a beginning or this is just one of various instances? Do you think it will not happen in the future? Uh, is there a sincere repentance? Uh, are you still able to forgive them, right? I mean, are you, you know, physically, emotionally able to look forward and just move on? Are you able to do that? And so on and so forth. There are other ways of doing that as well as to take some time off. Islamic di divorce is something that you, that you get that option of, you know, basically taking time and experiencing what it would be like to not be together, right? So this gives you time to process things and you don't have to make any hasty decisions. Okay, now let's move on to our section on spirituality where we talk about our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's talk about sexual morality. In today's world, we are seeing various standards of it, right? I mean, we are seeing different campaigns going out there, Me Too, uh, different scandals coming out, different people being accused of sexual harassment, uh, different types of, you know, weird behavior, strange behavior that used to be totally unacceptable in society is becoming acceptable now in some societies, right? So who really gets to define it, right? What is acceptable, what are what are we accepting as a society, right? So even if you remove any religious boundaries, most people, for example, would not accept adultery, right? They do see that as a very uh, inappropriate and very cruel and unjust thing to do, right? But then who is it that has the right to define what is a sexual morality, right? What is acceptable for the society? So think about this. Who really has that right, right? Actually, um, as I was looking at something that, you know, is accepted all across the board uh, i even found that there's certain people who are arguing in defense and on the acceptance of adultery if you really go for live and let live right i mean in that situation there's really no boundary right so if uh, if we do take that option if we do take that definition that look you know adultery is an accepted uh form of sexual immorality Right. And, you know, if a spouse does that, then he or she is violating the rights of the spouse. Right. So if you take that, then think about it. OK, so a husband or a wife has this route that that their uh, partner, their spouse should not use their body in a way that is displeasing to them. Right. They have exclusive access to that. OK. But if, if you accept that, then what about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who created all of us? What is his right, 
right? So imagine how a spouse feels if his wife or her husband cheats on them, right? How would they feel? But imagine now, walillahi al-mathal al-ala, for Allah is the greatest example, right? How would Allah, how are, what are we doing to Allah, what are we doing against Allah when we violate this right of Allah, when we violate this religion of Allah, when we violate this boundary of Allah, right? How low are we falling? So think about that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and defines in Surah Al-Mu'minun when He says, you know, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Certainly, indeed, verily, definitely, the believers have succeeded, right? And it defines several qualities of who true believers are, right? And then one of those qualities is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing. He says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ And they are the ones who guard their private parts. إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ مَلُومِينَ So by default, it is something private, right? You're supposed to guard it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they guard it except the ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made permissible, right? So the ones that you, for example, take in marriage, right? So if you have committed to the obligation, to the rights of a marriage bond, in the name of Allah, then it is permissible, right? And so on and so forth. So this is, Allah is the one who has the right, who has the, uh, who has the wisdom, who has the knowledge, who has the perfection to be able to even say that and to be able to even demand that. So now we also, from a perspective of how we are looking at the book, The Disease and the Cure, right? By Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, we are already on the chapter of Az-Zina, the illegal, the impermissible sexual activity. So now, Basically, we are on that chapter and he is describing how much of an evil, how much great this sin is, that this is from one of the major sins, right? And then he's describing that in his book. Now, one of the things that he says is that this happens, this act uh, of cheating, this act of adultery, this act happens in four stages, right? He will define those four stages and then he'll talk about those four stages. Today, we'll describe those four stages, but we'll only talk about the first stage. So he says, look, this starts with a look, right? This starts with an impermissible look, which brings about thoughts and ideas, which leads to words, which leads to deep and repeated thoughts, then desire, then will, and the will becomes an established intention, right? Which finally becomes an action. And when we say action, we are talking about the sin, the great sin of zina. Right, so it's talking about all these different stages, right? And in a way, these are these four stages of looks, thoughts, words, and then steps. Okay, and then the finally the sin happens, right? So today we'll be talking about the look. So from the advice, from the instruction of the Prophet of Allah, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is the hadith in which he's reported to have said, "O oh Ali." Do not follow a glance with another, for you will be forgiven for the first, but not for the second, right? So if you have a lustful desire on opposite gender, right, the first one is forgiven, right? But when you intentionally do look again, then it's not forgiven, right? Now, well, let me just first of all talk about how so many people make fun of this, right? Or oh, just keep your first one longer, right? I mean... This is off topic here, but this also comes in how we mock religion, right? So it's an it's a instruction from the Prophet of Allah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is talking, who is telling us on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can we mock with that, right? I mean, do we really have to make fun of everything? This could be a very serious issue. Right? And, and I see that many people do that with many other things as well, right? I mean, sometimes people are just having fun about, let's say, you know, the Android and iPhone debate, and they're like, oh, astaghfirullah, you use iPhone. Like, astaghfirullah is a dua that we are asking Allah to forgive us, right? Do you intend to say that or just you jokingly saying that? I mean, this is a serious thing. I mean, are you confident that Allah is happy with you mocking and taking these words lightly? I know I'm going off topic, but this is a serious thing to think about. Okay, coming back about lowering gaze. Okay, now, look, we are not 
uh, scholars here are trying to give fatwas, right? And we talked about it in our last episode when we were talking about a strategy and we talked about the danger of innovation and we talked about the importance of taking information and guidance from respected scholars who have the knowledge, who have the credentials, who have the experience, who have the trust of the ummah, right? So we would say, like, you, you go back and you, you understand it from your own scholars, what does lowering the gaze mean, right? I mean, obviously there are people who are on you know, both extremes here, right? You know, there are ways, there are places, there are situations in which it's permissible to look, right? How much, how long, how less, it depends on the situation. The asal is, free, it's forbidden, right? That you don't look at non mihram women, for example, right? But there are situations that may allow that based on the need, based on your own uh, personality, based on your own conduct, based on your le- your fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on and so forth. But again, this is not for me to dictate and it's not for us to, you know, make fun of each other, but it's important for us to go ahead and, you know, verify that and learn it and get it from trusted scholars. Okay, so, so we've talked about that, right? And then, um, you know, he goes on to explain a lot about this um, in his book about what is the dangers of having a look. Right, and it's much better and much easier to intercept it at the first instance, which is the look. It's much easier to be patient on preventing oneself from looking, than to prevent oneself when the desires have already developed. When the person is has high desires and it's very intense and he's very passionate, but he cannot get it, right? Due to various reasons, and then it's very hard to be patient on that. Right? Likewise, if there is a situation in which one is already addicted to watching inappropriate content, right? And this is something to think about that, you know, why is that happening? What emotional need uh, is the person meeting when he or she opens and watches things that are impermissible? Right? And, you know, there could be various ways of dealing with that. Obviously, first is to discipline oneself secondly you think about what is it that they're missing what emotional need or what um what what is it that they're trying to fulfill in their life right Um, is it because they're feeling loneliness is it because they're feeling a lack of purpose so it's much better for them to go ahead and you know build those um constructive behavior and constructive solution to those problems as opposed to going for the destructive behavior Uh, we talked about these two things in episode six and seven on how to heal from emotional trauma and you know how to replace destructive behavior so please check out those episodes as well and you know again like think about like it may give you some temporary pleasure but it's going to have a really harmful effect on your heart on your productivity on your psychology on your body and so on and so forth so it's very important to think about those things again recapping you know think about it what is where it is your fears are coming from you know your level of investigation and spying on the spouse who are your advisors you know if you do you know have um fear and you're you're suspicious without any justification you know think about it think about the qadr of allah your expectations from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, if there is a concern continue having you know weekly check-ins and honest communication to understand each other uh, if it gets confirmed then how would you deal with it and we talked about those steps uh, then we talked about you know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having the right to define sexual morality we talked about some of the dangers of not following uh, the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to in, or not intercepting it in an earlier stage and we talked about some of the ways and hinted at some of your previous episodes on how to deal with those situations so if you found these ideas beneficial if you found them to give you some uh, new insight if you found them to be you know good reminder go ahead and please and share it with your friends and family members and let us know what you think about these episodes and how we can uh, make them better or talk about ideas or questions that you have uh, or that are concerning to you